What are you finding out about knives? <laughs> trying to figure out if I am one. That was one of my first guesses, but then I settled on two. Yeah, I started reading the description of two, and I was like, yeah. But then as I was reading the one, um, there were things that also, you know, perfectionism and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, yeah, I could feel that. And then I was like, yeah. well, maybe I should start looking into all of these. <laughs> so I read well, the brief description, and nine was like, maybe also a nine. Yeah, I mean, um, you're going to have three fixes. There's something called tri-type, which is you're, you're going to have eight, nine, or one. Then you're going to have two, three, or four, and then five, six, or seven. Because in each of those cases, those three groups, those three numbers in the same group, are uh, how you deal with the same problem in life. So basically, you could, what you could say is you're going to have, yeah, like when you're looking at the um, image here, you're going to have how do you deal with anger? That's going to be the eight, nine, one. How do you deal with shame? The two, three, four. And how do you deal with fear? The five, six, seven. And then one of those is going to be primary for you. So, for instance, I'm an anger type, you could say, or a gut type is usually how they call it. So my core issue in life is anger. The gut types um, get in touch with spirituality and prayer through silence. So si silence is very healthy for me when I get to a place of silence, when I go for a walk in nature, when I get to a place where I can es essentially commune. Uh, actually, it's a guy from Albuquerque, uh, Richard Rohr who's a, yeah, Richard Rohr, I know, R-O-H-R, but yeah. you're like, oh. you're like Leonie, yeah. like, okay, yeah. I, oh. Lion, Rohr, okay, yeah. I get it, um, but basically he, he's a Franciscan monk, or he's like a modern day Franciscan Catholic sort of religious figure who uses Enneagram, um, he's actually an Enneagram one like me, but he uses Enneagram to sort of get in touch with the, the higher vibe, get in touch with the source, with God, with all that. And so for eight, nine, and one, these are people like myself who really need to go on long, silent walks. Like when I walked home yesterday, I was like, you're like, let me ride. I'm like, no, this is why I think you're yeah. a two, by the way, too. I was like, let me help you. Let me help you. Let me give you a ride. And I was like, no, no, I'm just going to walk. Yeah. Because that's how I center and how I get into a, a space through silence. Now, two, three, and four, these are all dealing with shame. And so your fundamental issue would not be anger, it would be shame. And it doesn't mean you'd be ashamed. It's more just, just like it doesn't mean I'm an angry person. Yeah. I actually have this ability at my highest vibe to overcome anger and find a deep peace, just as you have the ability to overcome shame and find a celebration and joy for life that doesn't get shamed in the way that other people do and fall into those traps, right. you know. But it has to do with self-esteem. And so the, the fundamental way for twos, threes, and fours to commune with God or to get higher vibe is basically through ritual. And ritual would be very important. Things like parades, celebrations, festivals, lighting incense, even bathing ritual, cooking ritual. I mean, these are ritualistic actions. You know, lighting some yeah. incense when you get in the bath, putting on some good music when you start cooking the food. It's not that I don't do those things. I do. It's just that that's not how I fundamentally commune. I'm not like yeah. fundamentally connected. Yeah, I feel like I don't do ritual often, but when I do, I'm like, ooh, this is nice. Yeah, someone else we yeah. know in that group is Richard Corbett. He's an Enneagram 3, and so he loves things like parades, or he loves, it's like very heartwarming for him to see, you know, festive, to see people come together. Now, it's heartwarming for me, too. I get choked up when I see Canyon Road you haven't been you haven't been in Santa Fe for Christmas like yet. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean on Christmas, like you're only two months here, so you're going to see you're in for a treat. Santa Fe is the most beautiful, heartwarming, touching Christmas celebration really? in the whole world. Oh yeah, it's very syncretic, yeah. and you'll have people doing Christmas carols in the next block over. There'll be Native American um, Santa Claus is here. people uh, making stew and different things. Yeah, no, it's very. I mean, it's it's an incredible blending of tradition, and I always go. Um, get soup the people get a lot of soup you know they make stews they make pozole and yeah santa claus literally lives here yeah he lives uh down at on 1331 a sierra azul santa fe new mexico the real north pole yeah. the real address of uh santa yeah. claus exactly okay so i know nothing about this to figure out which one you are you just read the descriptions and say that's I mean, me? Or... People do all sorts of tests. There's all sorts of debate. I mean, I think what I would say is the first thing is try type. So figure out which one you are from each group. So how do you deal oh, with yeah, the anger? Oh, yeah, so the last group. That's yeah, eight, nine, anger, one. Shame, and what's the last, the last one? one is fear. How do you deal with fear? And okay. that's uh, five, six, seven. 
And the thing is, people, it's hard to just know which one you are. Like, I'm an Enneagram 1. I'm Enneatype 1, as they say. Um, ones mostly think they're fear-based because I seem fearful because I'm afraid of doing the wrong thing, making a mistake, and so on. But you tell really quick I'm a gut type, an anger type. As soon as um, something comes up and you're like, wow, Jonah's very embodied in his anger right now. Um, so I'm a gut type means I'm basically fundamentally physical. Uh, if you're a two, three, or four, this is called the heart type. And these are, you know, have to do with shame and self-esteem. And they're fundamentally emotional. And then the fear types, they're also called head types. Um, oh. Those are the head types, five, six, and seven are fundamentally uh, mental. And so you see that it actually mirrors the structure in human design of the spleen, physical, the ajna, mental, the solar plexus, emotional. It mirrors the structure, but it is, there's no correlation. It's not like... Because the gut, you think, you know, sacral, but anger, you think manifester. Right. And there's also no correlation where like you have a defined spleen means you're this type or that. No, you have people that are born five seconds apart that are totally different types. It's just a repetition of the same fundamental structure, physical, mental, emotional. And all are reaching towards the spiritual. This seems like it has a lot of just like childhood. Your childhood was like this. I mean, for the two pages that I read. So is it more like you develop into one of these types based off of your upbringing? Or, you know, I don't think so. A lot of the Enneagram people think so. So they, I think it's because they're coming from like, um, you know, DSM kind of diagnostic criteria, psychology. They're trying to legitimate it yeah. scientifically. And so they're coming from psych backgrounds. And their psych background is always looking for etiology. Where did it come from? Ultimately, it came from the Big Bang. The Big Bang shattered the crystals of consciousness. We ended up in these different places. You know, and there's also this question. I personally believe your Enneagram type does not change lifetime after lifetime. To me, it would be silly if you spend a whole life learning a lesson and then you change to a different Enneatype and you learn that lesson. Then you get around all nine. You come back to the first. It's like, what? You forgot that lesson? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It makes more sense to me that you spend a whole lifetime learning the lesson of your type. And then the next lifetime, you kind of start at that baseline, but you still have so much further to go, but deepening what if you were in that like, type. Ah, shame was such a fun lesson. Let's go back and do that. You know, maybe you well, no, I think it is. You... I don't think you get to taste them all, though. I think it's almost like. It would be too easy. It would be off the hook. It's like, first of all, it imagines that you can sort of master the lesson in one life. I don't think you can. I mean, this... Well, maybe it's like four of shame and then three of anger and then two of fear and then you. You're like, yeah, let's do some more. You know, it just... Some people do believe that and they even believe that your Enneagram type changes throughout your life and things like that. I, I haven't found any evidence of that because for me, I'm like, this sort of righteous, indignant rage that the one feels had to have been around for 50,000 years. There's no way that I developed <laughs> this in my 41 years on earth yeah. or just the last couple lifetimes. Right. Sure. This is like 50,000 years of anger. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like tempering the spirit life after life. And each life, getting those same triggers and getting that anger and then having to like relax and accept and surrender and having to remember these kind of perennial lessons. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are too, then it would be each life learning that only when you deeply appreciate yourself will you truly be happy and looking for appreciation from others will never work and so it's kind of like the the perennial traps uh but again i mean yeah this this author helen so, palmer so obviously the happening yeah and if you get to decide which one you're going to do for all eternity i don't think so i think it's just kind of anger Category well, so these are fundamentally, each one of these fundamentally cor correlates to a planet. So it's almost like who is your true planetary ruler? Mm. So if we look at Enneagram 3, the achiever or the performer, that's the sun. They're on stage. Sure. It's the sun. Two is the moon. They're the helper. They're here to nurture and support the kind of mother archetype, the father archetype, the mother archetype. Yeah. I'm a one. That's the mercury archetype. Um, you're a lawyer, so you're very much in a mercurial profession, but you know that so much is about not only how you you use language but also what is right and wrong because lawyers have very strong ethics i think it's a big misunderstanding that lawyers will kind of do anything to win a case and stuff. It's absolutely not <laughs> yeah. ethics are 100 percent front and center in all legal matters and so it is very mercurial to sort of weigh weigh the, the sort of ethical i know that scales are libra but i think that's a little yeah. bit different what uh planet's nine nine is venus Okay. Eight is Mars, seven is Jupiter. So you can see they follow the order. Mm -hmm. uh, six is Saturn, five is Uranus, and four is Neptune. Mm -hmm. And because this is a very old system, we didn't have um, you know, Uranus and Neptune back then. 
So it would just kind of go up to Saturn and then Saturn and then Jupiter. Basically following um, in, you know, Hellenistic astrology, they do something called the, the Thema Mundi, which is like the, yeah. the astrological chart for the birth of the world. It basically follows that, starting with sun and moon going out, you know, then going out to Virgo, Gemini, ruled by Mercury, Libra, Taurus, ruled by Venus, Scorpio, yeah. Mars, so, sorry, Scorpio, Aries, ruled by Mars, Sagittarius, Pisces, and then finally um, Capricorn and Aquarius. Yeah, I do mostly Hellenistic astrology and all my usual uh, astrology stuff. Like I like the um, annual perfections and I do the whole sign houses. I made that joke stuff. yesterday, you know, old habits die hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. you've been doing it for thousands of years. It's, yeah. I'm joking. Exactly. No, that's that's past life like humor. Now, yeah. Just past life humor, you know. It's, you know. Um, but when I took the more modern, I don't know, when it came around of sort of Scorpio being ruled by Pluto instead of Mars, and that's my rising sign, and, um, you know, like, what was the other? Aquarius yeah, and... Yeah, Aquarius, um, Uranus, Pisces, no longer Jupiter, now it's Neptune. Yeah, and that just, all three of those, to me, I just felt fit real good. Well, that raises real a question good. of if the Enneagram's been around for thousands of years, were Enneagram fives, which are now ruled by Uranus, were they more Saturnine before Uranus was discovered? And Enneagram fours, which are ruled by Neptune, were they more jovial before Neptune was discovered? And one of the, I really like Rick Tarnas. You're probably familiar with his work, um, Cosmos and Psyche. He has some really good points about archetypes, which uh, basically that archetypes, different cultures have different understandings of archetypes. And so, for instance, Western culture, we have very strong understandings of Venus and Mars. We don't have very strong understandings of like Pluto and Neptune as much as compared to India, where you have like Kalima for Pluto, or you have um, Neptune, you have the Maya, and things like that, and these kind right. of concepts that have been developed. So that's one point is that is that different cultures have different access. The other point he makes is that archetypes tend to redouble, and so at different times, sort of, we will represent things certain ways, like Mars will be male and Venus will be female. But then because of redoubling, we can imagine the male Venus, Oscar Wilde, the dandy. We can imagine the female Mars, the Amazon warrior woman, and so on. Right. So it's kind of like... That's another interesting aspect of it. And then I guess the only thing I would add personally is that it seems to me that you have this beautiful movement um, that was almost like scaffolding, the movement of, you know, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then Saturn, Jupiter. So it almost like got to the end and went back. Right. And then in the last 300 years, since 1781, discovery of Uranus, we've now had this unfolding into Neptune and Pluto. People even say that Pluto is in the space between so between the two. Yeah, it's like it's in the void. Yeah, like Pluto like, is the void. Like Pluto yeah. has decided a planet, and then no, you're no longer a planet, and then you're a planet again. No, you're not. And it, and it doesn't like, even have so a Pluto point. To like yeah, die exactly. And then, and then come back. And then yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And then that Pluto is literally this void between, you know, Neptune and uh, Uranus here, where it's kind of. It's almost like a spiral. You see the spiral, and now it keeps spiraling in towards the center, towards source. And I think that's what's interesting is that maybe before, because Enneagram has been around for really millennia, um, theoretically, nobody really knows how old it is, but it's said to have been a Sufi teaching tool from you know 800 AD and so on. Um, in the modern era, popularized by Gurdjieff, but um, and then some other people. But in any case, um, yeah, it's it's. I think it's definitely unfolded. So as far as like w who chose your enneagram type, it's kind of like, well, that's your, that's your planet. You're an emissary for that planet, almost. You're a conduit for that planetary energy. And so, me being enneagram one, I have a hard time imagining that one of my past lives I was anything other than a one. It seems like every life I'm always kind of a conduit for the mercurial force. And if you're a nine, you're the Venus force. If you're a two, you're the Moon force. It's sort of like, what force are you representing on this plane? Hmm, and that's that's something that we can't and really then escape. Does it yeah. actually cross over with your actual, but it wouldn't necessarily cross over with your actual birth times and things. Right? No, it's because, a it's a repetition of yeah. the structure. It's the same thing you find with personality type. It's the same thing you find with the cards right. of destiny. It's like basically how do I pick my planet. Do I want to go? Do I want to go moon? Do I want to go my yeah. chart ruler, <laughs> which All I of, could decide but, is but, Aries or Scorpio. Or but you really, you really can't. Controls. I mean, that's the thing is, so, and here's, a, here's, I guess what I'd say is nature is very economical. And so anytime a new structure is needed at a new layer, it essentially reuses the same structure, yeah. but gives you a new 
option for configuration. So that's the way I would put it is that you could be born literally a few seconds apart from someone else, different in the type. It's, it's a mystery, right? How does that work? Um, a lot of times identical twins are the same Enneagram type, but there are interesting questions of, of um, even in the case of you know, identical twins, is that the same personality sharing two forms almost? Is one of the okay, you know the sort of like, would you rather type questions? Sure. Okay, what if you had to only pick sort of one system? Would you rather have Enneagrams or the personality coins? Objective personality? Yeah. That's a good question. It's kind of like saying in astrology, would you rather have the planets or the signs or something? You know what I mean? It's a little bit like you can only have one. Um, I would say Enneagram speaks to deep motivations. It, it, like it, it, I guess like Enneagram is not really that different than the concept of the seven deadly sins, except there are nine of them. So it's the nine deadly sins. So in a way, because I love the question of the human heart at odds with itself, grappling, trying to do good and not do evil, mm -hmm. Enneagram is very close to my heart there because I see it as this wonderful vocabulary of describing all the ways the planetary influences can intoxicate someone and pull them away from source. Yeah. So it's almost like when you're Mars crazy, you're going to be aggressive and violent. When you're Mercury crazy, you're going to be judgmental and puritanical. When you're Venus crazy, you're going to be you know, addicted to indecision and peace and avoidance. When you're moon crazy, you're going to be, you know, a, like addicted to basically helping someone and then, you know, reflecting their brilliance and kind of getting that vicarious enjoyment through them. Mm -hmm. So, so Enneagram is a system that shows the different ways you can become a lunatic and a Marsitic mm -hmm. and a Venusitic and a Jupiter tick, right? A, a Jupiter holic. <laughs> right. It, it basically shows the addictions, the addictions to the planetary energies and how people become crazy because of those. Mm. Objective personality gives an incredibly rich vocabulary for how our cognition works and our fundamental human needs. So it relates how cognition is tuned to address particular human needs. So it's much more evolutionary. I think if I had to choose probably Enneagram simply because it's there's so much drama. Mm. There's so much drama. It yeah. really is, you know, every great story ever written can be seen through the terms of Enneagram. You could see it through the terms of objective personality, but that would be very reductionistic and evolutionary, almost like people trying to get their needs met. When you see it through Enneagram, you really see each of us has this human heart, this soul that's deep within us that is trying and striving to learn and to essentially overcome our addictions. It's almost like stoicism, to overcome the addiction to wrong behavior, to reactivity and so on. And then our Enneagram type is basically showing us where we're addicted. I, I think you know the objective personality system is similar. I mean, you can be addicted to novelty or addicted to certainty or addicted to connection. We've talked about that. Different needs we get hooked on. But it's, it's a little more reductionistic and scientific. People try to make Enneagram scientific, but ultimately it's a mystical teaching tool. And yeah. what it's showing you is you're watching a story, and it's a story of will that person be able to overcome their innate, uh, I don't even want to call it the shadow nature, but just habitual nature, their habitual nature, in, in order to truly learn and to break the pattern and to sort of transcend. So Enneagram is a system of transcendence and even ascension. And I like that because to me, it's showing this very clear direction of growth. Whereas the objective personality system, there is a lot of learning and a lot of power in that, but so much of it is almost just like evolutionary psychology saying like, well, we know that we need food and water and shelter and rest. We also have these other psychological needs and so it's kind of a little more like looking at it almost like evolutionary biology. In this, they try to make it evolutionary biology, but it's not. It's mystical teaching, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. now, next level, Enneagram versus uh, Cards of the Magi. Cards of the Magi is Enneagram. all about, I think Enneagram still, because Cards of the Magi is all about understanding this incarnation in relation to other incarnations. So it's almost like where you fit in with the whole. Mm -hmm. And Enneagram is so much more personal. It's almost like, are you right with God? Like Cards of the Magi is kind of like, what is my role here? Like, you know, what am I here to do? How do I relate to other people in this? What cards have I been dealt in this life? What tools do I have at my disposal? And 
because it changes every life, you're really seeing kind of, and it even changes every year, it's really a system of changes. It's almost like the I Ching or something where you're seeing, okay, each year I get a new hand. Each year I'm in a new position. Each year I'm seeing from a different place on the board. Um, I, I have a fundamental position that I hold for this life, but next life I have a different one. Yeah. And previous life I have a different one. And there's this wheel of karma, this magic circle in the cards of the Magi. And you're basically moving through all of these patterns. And there's seven-year cycles and 13-year cycles and annual cycles and 52-day cycles. I mean, there's so many cycles. So to me, that's not as compelling as, like, this cuts deep. That's not, like, the reason Cards of the Magi isn't as compelling is that Enneagram is really telling you what you're up against, where you're your own worst enemy, where you're sabotaging yourself, where you're addicted to basically separation from the divine will. So it's very religious in that sense. Yeah. And, you know, what you can do. Read it. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's beautiful. It's great. I mean, it's it's something, it's like a life work. Like okay. Enneagram is a life work. So now Enneagram yeah. versus human design, if you don't have one. I would pick human design, ultimately because Enneagram is is about the spirit and it's the, the spiritual question, the perennial question that if you don't get it right this life, you'll get it right next life. If you don't get it right then, you have another life yeah. and it never changes. Human design is, there's a time limit. As soon as you die, your human design body graph is no longer important for your spiritual development in any way, shape or form. And human design is ultimately about mechanics, awareness, purpose. How do the mechanics work? It's like an operating manual for how you operate in the world. Where can you learn and where's the opportunity to learn so you can develop that you know, awareness? And then how do you fulfill your life purpose? Enneagram is not really telling you your life purpose. It's telling you a fundamental structure that you carry with you across all life lifetimes, I believe. And it's not really giving you much of a hint as to what your role is. So human design is sort of the ultimate because if you only had one thing, Basically, human design would be there to orient you to the correct trajectory, to be in the right place with the right people, and to know how to make the right decisions so you fulfill your life purpose. And that's really the goal, to have a life well lived. I mean, it gets back to Plato and to the question of what is a, what is a good life and, and what is the true and the good, the beautiful, the true and the good? Are they all the same thing? And, and how do we achieve them? And it even gets to stoic questions about how do we forbear the the easy escapes from things and, and basically learn how to quell our reactivity. So much of human design is about quelling that reactivity so that you can make correct decisions. Um, and basically everything in human design is that it is all reaction and there is really no choice in that reaction, but there is awareness. And as the awareness changes, the reaction changes. And so you get to witness how you react differently now than how you used to react because you now have this information of how to correctly make decisions. In the not really. Uh, I don't think, I mean, not really, but yet there, but yet the cosmic human drama is always about decision making. So the way I always explain it is like, you're watching, you know, Theon Greyjoy and he seems like a good guy and then he does some really bad things. You want him to be a good guy again. And you're, or like you're watching like bubbles in, you know, the wire and you're like, don't do it. Bubbles like stay clean <laughs> bubbles. Like, like we're crossing our fingers, watching the person, hoping they make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a weightlifter where if they're not strong enough, they're going to drop the weight. And if bubbles isn't strong enough, he's going to go back on heroin. And if the young Greyjoy isn't strong enough, he's going to kill those innocent people. And you know, the, the moral question is always, like, this is the only thing we really enjoy watching in drama is the heart at odds with itself. That was actually an answer from George R. R. Martin. He asked what he writes about. And he said, the human heart at odds with itself. The only thing you can write about, right? And if you read, like, screenwriting stuff, like screenwriting systems like Dramatica, they say that a scene is utterly boring if there's no dramatic tension within one of the characters themselves. So the height of drama is you don't know the outcome not because you're like, is the ball going to make it in the hole? Or that's like a sports thing or something. You yeah. know, is the, is the person going to make the jump? Um, it's not about that. It's about, I mean, that's the basics of drama. But the true drama is what decision will they make? Is she going to stay with him or leave him? Is he going to pick up the, the drink or stay sober? Yeah. Is he going to lay down his weapon or, or fight? Well, it's the romance, the genre, then she can never have him. <laughs> sure, but but then it's hand. but then it's still that will they won't they like <laughs> did you see Challengers? Have you seen Challengers? Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, it's really good. But it's the same. I heard some people say it was kind of trite and superficial and all this stuff, and I'm like, 
I didn't know what was going to happen to the very end. Like it was like the, it was like two hours into the movie and you know, the very last scene, and I'm still like, what is going to happen? Like, is she going to do it or isn't she? Is he going to do it or isn't he? There's three characters in it, and they're in a love triangle, and like right to the very end, you don't know what they're going to do, and that is the drama. And so I think that's where it gets into the question of no choice. Is like, yeah, you can't choose up front intellectually to just be like. I have chosen to resolve this dilemma any more than the weightlifter can choose mentally to be able to lift the heavy weight. But as they're lifting it and you're like, are they going to be able to do it? Are they going to be able to do it? And then there's a triumph. They're able to do it or there's a tragedy. They aren't and they fail. And it's the same thing. There's a triumph when the heroin addict kicks heroin. There's a tragedy when they, when they don't. So, I mean, this is, these are it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's triumph and tragedy. Triumph and tragedy are always real. And when people in human design kind of have the idea that if there's no choice, so it means there's no difference in triumph and tragedy, that is a wrong interpretation of no choice. It reminds me of the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, who people misinterpret as being purely relativistic. And someone asked him, they said, so are you saying that true is the same as false and good is the same as evil and it's all just relative? And he said, no, that is a wrong interpretation. That's right. You heard me. That is an incorrect, <laughs> wrong way of understanding my teaching. Mm -hmm. And his star disciple, uh, Gayatri Spivak, she did a class, and I, I, I went to her class. And the people who introduced her said, we have the esteemed Gayatri Spivak, and here, even though she's teaching us, we have no difference in teachers and students. We're all collaborators. We're all one. And she said, well, that's a very sweet idea. Thank you for introducing me. But I am here to teach, and you are my <laughs> students. And, you know, so there is this idea, again, that, like, no choice, like, levels the playing field and means it doesn't really matter what the outcome is. That's not true. Ra said no choice doesn't mean no chance. And so there's a chance the weightlifter will lift the weight. There's a chance the heroin addict will kick the heroin. There's a chance the evil person who isn't really evil deep down, they've just done evil, will find some sort of redemption and will do good and will actually take some heroic action to redeem themselves. In other words, redemption is possible. That's where Enneagram is powerful because it shows you where redemption is possible. It shows you where for lifetime after lifetime, you could have been succumbing to the sort of evils of your type but then you've been able to somehow ascend or transcend and get to a place where you're able to actually surrender to the life and achieve, um, you know, the, the higher echelons of what your, your type is capable of. That being said, I don't think that this book will get you there or any Enneagram practice will get you there. Mm -hmm. That's where human design is so powerful. I've met people who grew up in Enneagram cults. Well, I met one person. I actually had dinner with this guy, and he told me it was an absolute nightmare. He grew up in, I think it was Claudio Naranjo's kind of cult or something, and it was basically like every single thing you did was scrutinized in terms of Enneagram, and it just really messed him up. Yeah. And so it shows how there is no escape. I mean, people can use human design, no choice, to justify atrocities. People can use Enneagram to explain away anything. And we have to ask ourselves what we're doing when we're explaining. Are we justifying, minimizing, rationalizing, explaining away, or are we using a system uh, for deeper understanding? And so there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no real escape. You know, some people might say, I found Enneagram. Now I don't have to worry about all this stuff. It's like, no, you always have to worry about it. You have to remain ever vigilant for cultism and ever vigilant for <laughs> yeah. rationalization and minimization and abuse and all of these things. Which is why ultimately I do put sort of uh, what I would call heart-centered values like chivalry and honor and dignity and, and all these like higher qualities above any sort of practice. I got in a big argument, I won't go into details of course, but with James Alexander where he was saying these are all seven-centered concepts. And I'm like, no, they mostly emerged in the 17, 1800s. They mostly emerged even going back to 15, 1600s. But like in this modern wave, like it's taken us this long, thousands and thousands of years of barbarism to sort of then have these, I mean, not to say, okay, Prior to that, I should say thousands and thousands of years of Western barbarism. Obviously, there are indigenous cultures and indigenous wisdom traditions that were mostly matriarchal and were mostly actually had some of this higher knowledge that was then lost. But by and large, um, the history of our modern era of Western culture has been one of progressive unfolding of these higher concepts, and we shouldn't just throw them all away like, oh, that's just a seven-centered concept, you know. No, chivalry is not dead. Honor is real. Dignity is real. Respect is real. I mean, all of these things 
they were hard earned historical moments in the development of the human consciousness and the, basically the human oversoul. So as, as we developed these concepts, we shouldn't be so quick to throw them away. Now that we have human design and now that we know none of it really matters because there's no choice or something right. like that. Like to me, that doesn't, that's not, that's a wrong reading of no choice. No choice simply means basically Pascal's wager. If you're forced to do something, you should act as if you were doing it willingly because only then can you <laughs> adopt the full responsibility for it. And if you're forced to do it and you don't do it willingly, then you're essentially pretending it's coming from without. And, um, you know, it's sort of like, like if you have no choice, you might as well, then your only real choice is to try to pretend that you really had, that you chose to do it in the first place. It's like, it's a funny little short circuit, you know, yeah. it's like, I should do that, which I am forced to do willingly so that I'll do it well. Because if the whole time I'm doing it saying... Assuming you can do it well even when you're doing really nice. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's, that's the only yeah. chance you'll be able to do it well. That's the only chance. Like if we have a role to play and we say... I mean, here's how I put it almost. It's like, okay, there's a, there's a technique from dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy, which is used for a lot of people who have borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, things like that. They have a hard time with splitting. And one of the main things they do is they can't hold ambiguity, people who have these disorders. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is they'll split and they'll so say... They can't be lawyers. You need to hold a lot of ambiguity. You need to hold a lot of ambiguity. So what they'll do is they'll say, uh, I want to go for a run. Or sorry, I want to sit on the couch, uh, but I should run. Or I want to keep on my diet. Or I, I want to eat this ice cream, but I should keep on my diet. Uh, I want to smoke a cigarette, but I shouldn't smoke. And this is splitting because what it's doing is disavowing as these two different directions, right? And what they do in dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy is you can only say want. You never can say should. So you say, I want a cigarette and I want to quit. I want to eat this ice cream and I want to stick to my diet. I want to sit on the couch and I want to go for a run. You know, I want to stay faithful to my partner and I want to have this other experience or whatever. Yeah. And by affirming the ambivalent desire, you sort of humanize it and make yourself so much more multidimensional. And it's the same thing, I think, with Pascal's wager. Instead of saying, like, I just want to live my life but God is forcing me to do this or life is forcing me to do that. Instead of disavowing that desire, you just say, I want to do this and I want to do that. And you sort of affirm, you know, like I want to live the life that I imagine and I want to live the life that is given to me, even though those are two very different things. But I think that's where human design really helps with no choice, surrender, strategy and authority. I mean, these are ways of getting in touch with the movement of life so that we like have an actual practice and can then understand the actual mechanics and watch them happen in real time and go, wow, I saw that I was trying so hard to make this happen. As soon as I, and it's not that you stop trying, you just try for something else. Instead of trying to initiate it, trying to manifest it. Now I'm just trying to wait to respond. Right. You're still trying, you know, if you don't try, <laughs> yeah. then, then you're just going to be purely reactive and unconscious and you might as well just be an automaton or a robot at that point. Um, because there's no real consciousness there. I mean, we are conscious beings. I really liked the answer Karen Curry Parker gave. Did you get to see her talk at the conference? No, I so came at the very end people are very critical of her, but I think she's just amazing. And also, how can you be critical of someone with eight kids who's just like so like what a cool yeah, person? Just, you know, she's, she's just like the mom of the world. She's so good. good. Yeah. yeah, she's like not only has she raised eight kids, but she's like brilliant and amazing and all these things. And so she talks a lot about attitude and about. Um, basically trauma and people having like like basically almost like limiting beliefs things like that i talk about that a lot too having a positive mental attitude overcoming limiting beliefs changing your perception of the world and how you see things and so the question from the audience uh it's kind of the audience was like how do you reconcile that with human design where human design dismisses the mental and the mind as thinking it runs the show and you're talking about changing you know your mental attitude and changing your mind and so on and she goes well i think um she had a really good answer. She said, I think we have to realize that these things aren't just in the mind. They're in the cells in your body. Like there's an actual physical component of them. And so, yeah. and I think that's what's amazing. And that's what we're realizing with epigenetics and things like that is that right. it's not just that I go, okay, I changed my mind. I don't get to just choose to change my mind like that. It's that that's not it. It's that you, you unwrap and go through layers and layers of realization that actually do cause cellular changes in your body so that your body itself has its own intelligence that doesn't um, be stifled by, by being locked in 
various trauma responses and things like that. So, I mean, I, I really see it all the time where people who've been through trauma get locked in what in human design we call color transference. And uh, so if you know your, your, your you know, motivation minus desire, my trauma response is your need. So you would get locked in fear. So I, I see people with your color who get locked in irrational fears. Um, they're afraid of roving gangs that will kidnap them or they're afraid of, you know, just like absurd yeah. fears, like things that are very unlikely to happen. But it's usually because they had some trauma that, you know, occurred to them that happened to them and then they haven't worked through that trauma. Yeah, mine are more like, I imagine the crazy thing happening and then me fixing it. Like, oh, I'll imagine the plane crashing, but then me saving saving people off. The yeah, you'll be like, what is needed here? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah really, well, you're, well, you're staying really in the need. I don't worry about it, but I'm like, what if it does happen? <laughs> you're staying here in the need too, because that's the need is all about doing what needs to happen in that situation. I mean, need is kind of the ultimate. I mean, it kind of, it's, it is, I mean, the, the fourth color is the, the color of colors. It's sort of the no color that is the substrate of everything else. So uh, three and four have a very interesting relationship in that way. I'm three, desire, you're four, need. And they're both, um, they're called the, the developmental colors because it's all about development and learning and, and progress and so on. But, but yeah, need, I mean, that staying in your need is not getting caught into, but how will you save them? Because then you, you get into the fear. Well, how am I going to do that? What if I'm not able to do that? And then the fear mm -hmm. kicks in. But as yeah, long as you, yeah, you just leave the how, <laughs> leave the how out of it. So that's why, I mean, ultimately, like Enneagram's beautiful system. Human design is what's actually going to give you an understanding of how to operate and how your consciousness is experiencing the world. It's sort of the apparatus your consciousness plugs into. Because, you know, last life you might not be need and next life you won't be need. But right. this life you are. So it's giving you a hint at how your awareness works. It's showing you the mechanics, and then it's giving you a hint at how to fulfill your purpose. <coughs> and this no, is I'm not, sure this is not, you know, my purpose as an Enneagram One in this lifetime is not really described by Enneagram One. This is almost like the soul's purpose over every lifetime. But my purpose in this lifetime might be to bring human design knowledge into the world as best I can, or, you know, yeah. or preserve it or things like that. Um, Ra, obviously, his purpose was to bring human design knowledge into the world for the first time. I mean, his was to originate human design knowledge, to be this clarion um, sounding the, the horn to say that the, the old mysticisms were over and that it's the and end it of the world. It wasn't just actually like just to repopulate like that type of hat for a while or something. Like, what if we think it's this grant? <laughs> no, I, I love that. Like, yeah, his actual purpose, his actual different. purpose was to like, you know, play guitar and make this amazing music. Like 200 years from now, they'll be like, so he made this weird system, but yeah. his songs but are song incredible. The songs are... Like, uh, well, someone but, else needed to hear that song and that given... But, you know, but that it's it. actually, it's all part of it because, I mean, ultimately we can't really even separate the purpose so much other than people do ask about purpose. And I always say, well, look at Ra. It was pretty obvious that he lived out his purpose. He had a job to do and he did it. And he would have failed if... Like we, we could tell he failed to live out his purpose if human design did not get into the collective. That would have been failure. So it's not like your purpose is guaranteed. This is that same kind of relativism. It's like this idea like um, maybe it doesn't really matter anyway. Like what if Ra never brought it in? Like no, I think probably hundreds of people had encounters with the voice and Ra was the only one in all of history who's been able to actually take that encounter mm -hmm. and create a system out of it. Right. He, he said... Um, he got the, he asked the voice where all the knowledge was coming from, and the voice said, from the book of letters, or even the book that he imagined or kind of got was actually called from the book of letters. So it's from, from the book of letters. And uh, interestingly enough, Ra had told a few people this, and a couple of years later, he, he um, heard from someone who knew a, a man who had gone completely insane and had filled up pages with scrawling and rambling, but somewhat interestingly human design adjacent, and same thing, he had written where it was all from, and he'd written from the Book of Letters. So, and of course, the Book of Letters is an actual sacred, sacred book. Um, it's like a sacred Hebrew book to um, it's one of the sacred books of Judaism, I, I believe, anyway, or at least one of the mythical sacred books. But um, I'm not exactly sure the history of it. But I guess I'm just saying, like, these, these 
things are out there. People are having these experiences and you can succeed and you can fail. So Bubbles can kick heroin and live with his sister or he can go back on the street. Right. Theon Greyjoy can give in to his lower nature and kill innocent people or he can remain strong against that. And in each of these cases, it's like the spirit is tested or the soul is tested, however you want to look at that. Um, you know, people use the terms interchangeably. I, I think of the soul as sort of the eternal soul, the thing that's developing life after life. And I think of spirit as sort of our connection to source and our sort of lifeblood. And when the spirit is crushed is when we've lost all that connection. And then the soul is yearning out in pain because it's feeling that alienation of aloneness because it's lost its connection to spirit. Uh, but people use these terms pretty interchangeably. But I, I guess the point being just that it does make a difference. Like raw putting human design into the world versus raw not putting human design into the world. One is succeeding and the other is failing. And Bubbles kicking heroin is a success and a triumph and should be celebrated and him going back on the street. For those who don't know, this is all reference to The Wire. Yeah. I imagine most, <laughs> most people have seen The Wire, right? I yeah. mean, the, if you yeah, haven't yeah. seen The Wire, where have you been? Oh, Come on. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, that's kind of assuming, though, that human design is going to remain this thing that sort of helps people, right? And that transforms into... Um, I don't know, a severe cult or something, or a just gets yeah. warped in its interpretation. Well, it, it's already, it does. sure, but it's already done so much good for the world. I mean, the, the point is, like, it can turn into a cult later, and then it'll be people's, it'll help people by them right, then having, cult. or them thinking for themselves to know, to know not to buy that. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't think that the ultimate end result retroactively determines the value of what came before it. This is a philosophical debate, and people like Ray Brassier say the ultimate heat death of the universe will retroactively render everything before it as meaningless, mm -hmm. since it's all going to turn into frozen space dust eventually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eventually everything just gets cold and dark, and we have no more light and no more heat. And everything dies, and that is the ultimate outcome in the current models of where the whole universe ends up. Um, and yet... Or like the guy who yeah. created you know, the thing that started that then led to the atomic bomb. Right, exactly. His purpose. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and there are, I mean, it's interesting that when you think about purpose, I, I guess my answer to that is there is always a best outcome at any given point. Um, I don't know what that sound is. That, uh, and, and, you know, you can get really meta. I was talking a lot with Indra about this. I don't know if you had a chance to talk to Indra much mm -hmm. at the conference. Um, anyway, Indra is a very... Very interesting dude, Indra Shaker Singh, and he was kind of holding court every night during the conference and having these long conversations. And people would say, "Was it is that good or is that bad?" He would say, "Good and bad are just created; they're yeah. just imagined. There's no such thing as good or bad, and, and so on." And I don't really agree because even even in him saying that, he's sort of implying that that's the good way of seeing the world. And similarly, people like say, "I don't believe anything." Well, that's a belief. Like you can't really escape. You know, I have no assumptions. Well, you're assuming you have no assumptions. Like, assumptions are what yeah. we use to talk about things. The moment that we try to talk about them directly, we have new assumptions that are hidden from view. And so there are certain structural aspects of reality that are not easily escaped. And one of them is the judgment of good and bad, or success and failure, or things like this nature. Binary. We can't just escape the binary by affirming non-duality. At the same time, what Indra was right about, and what I think all great mystics and thinkers of the ages are right about, is that there is a non-dual aporia, which is a Greek term to mean almost paradox or intractable, unsolvable problem at the core of every duality. So that's what prevents the duality from ever being resolved on one side or the other. So it's not that reality is fully non-dual, it's that it's both non-dual and singular at the same time. It's dual substance monism, as Jung called it, which is both two and one. And it's the oneness that prevents the two from ever fully becoming one, or the tension between the one and the two. In other words, um, if it were all the same and there's no difference in good and evil, then that would just be oneness. And if it is just good and evil only, then that would be two-ness. But what we actually have is the fact that we can't ever truly resolve which is for the, the good or the evil, and yet we can't eradicate the concepts either because any attempt to do so just repeats the same structure. Uh, I have a friend who had a very intense ayahuasca journey on his 25th birthday, and 
he showed up late to the ayahuasca ceremony, so the shaman gave him some from his own batch. Oh, <laughs> and this and this friend was actually, I've known since I was three years old, he was actually conceived on ayahuasca. So this was almost like his yeah. like rite of passage coming into yeah. manhood. And what he did was at that point he was a Sufi and he had all these he Sufi beads. On ayahuasca. Yeah, what? I know. I know. <laughs> I, know. I know some interesting people. What can I say? What can I say? And so he was doing his prayer beads because he was trying to not be intoxicated because he was a Sufi at, the, at that yeah. time. And he was basically like, I'm not going to be intoxicated. I'm just going to keep my focus on the, the one pointed focus of the oneness with God and pray and pray and pray. But then he kept kind of faltering. And every time he would falter, he would start to feel this accumulation of all of these things and all this baggage. And the shaman would come to him and he would do this thing where he'd put his hand right before his eyes like that. Then he would turn it like this. No. And my friend would experience oh, yeah. oh, almost yeah. like he had a shelf with everything yeah. on it that was just like falling oh, wow. off. And he said he experienced <laughs> it as the truth going vertical, at which point he would be like, it's, and he would try to grasp it. But That's every something I want to try. But every like word, any, yeah, exactly. Any juggies, yeah, <laughs> but every word he would try to get, like it was like a hook that would just slide off of yeah. the purely vertical truth, and then slowly over time, truth would become horizontal again. The guy would come back and he would do this again, <laughs> and he kept like turn, like standing up the truth, wow. so that it couldn't be put into words and it couldn't be grasped. Yeah. And so what my friend really came away from this experience knowing is like. The truth is vertical, Jonah. <laughs> like, take his own hand to kind of just put it back. So can yeah, he's basically like, happening. like, let's just get back. Okay, now <laughs> I see what's happening. Whoop, okay. here we go again. <laughs> yeah. But this is kind of the idea is that there is this sort of, the, the, the verticality of truth is the paradoxical apparatic nature at the heart of it. And then when it goes back like this, it's back in the world of duality and good and evil and right and wrong. And I mean, I think it is, it is one of those interesting things where, um, you know, there it is kind of like the living life force energy that then settles into inertia. It is life to death. Life is this vertical thing that can't really be grasped. And then you put it back into its dead place. And that's where we have the cults, the Enneagram cult and all these things, mm -hmm. which are sort of the improper use of this living knowledge. So I think it's remembering that the only, the only good knowledge is living knowledge. And once the, the knowledge dies, it then is used as rules. And rules are for people who can't think for themselves. And rules are for people who can't make decisions for themselves. I think I think Chaitan Parkin was actually saying that at the conference. He was going on, he was going on about rules. He was like, You don't need rules in life. Rules are only if you don't know how to make decisions. Like like rules are there for people who can't so he's not bring a awareness to something. <laughs> it's a good question, actually. I haven't really looked at this at his astrology, so Mm. Oh man. Well, I'm an Enneagram one, so this conversation is like right up my alley. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Let's see if uh we have any and then we gotta get to that pizza party, but let's see. Um yeah. so okay, so go, going back to the three, the first question is sort of are you a gut type, are you a heart type, are you a head type? The gut types, they they commune with God through silence. This is from you know Richard Rohr. Richard Lyon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's not me. No. Um, well, I don't know. It could be. But it's definitely me. I like to go on these long walks in nature, and I like yeah. to be in the silence and so on. And, um, and then the, the heart types are through ritual and through going to church and communion and having dinners and celebrations and parades and all of the bathing and eating and all of these kind of ritualistic things we do. And then the head types are through um, basically meditation and silencing the mind. And so they're the ones like J Johnny is a seven and he's going to a 12 day Vipassana retreat. That's the best thing for him because his mind is always chattering. And so the silencing of the mind, it's, it almost sounds like the gut type, but like the gut type can do it on a long walk in nature. For him, it's almost like get to the single pointedness of thought. Mm -hmm. My friend I mentioned who had that whole ayahuasca experience, same deal, he's a seven. That's why he had these prayer beads to bring him to a single-minded focus of thought so he could focus his mind because that's essentially how he's able, that's his method or his point of access. Um, and also a good friend, Augustina, she's been in transcendental meditation for decades now. Same deal, she's an Enneagram 7, so transcendental meditation is really, really good for her. Um, I think David Lynch is probably an Enneagram 5, that's another head type. It's probably really good for him to do TM. 
less important for me. I can get the same effect by going out in nature, going for a long walk. Yeah, I'd much rather silence. like um, have a bath or eat a meal than meditate. Yeah, and maybe that's your way of, of or you know, in, any sort of experience made sacred, taking the mundane experience, but elevating it to the point of the sacred and sort of experiencing the divine in it is is sort of how the twos and threes and fours access the divine. So having ecstatic experiences, having peak experiences and so on. Um, dancing and sex and food and all those things. Um, adventure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's taking it and elevating it to the level of, of the sublime. So, and then the, the next part of it, and I guess we can kind of wrap up because I know pizza party, speaking of ritual, yeah. ritualistic pizza <laughs> eating. Yeah. Uh, basically, the the next part of it is to look at there are subtypes, there's wings, and then there's also the instinctual variants. And recently, a guy named Rob Zeke Colopy has really blown Enneagram wide open. And now I know some others are following suit and kind of doing their own versions of this with expanded Enneagram instincts. We're kind of going through an Enneagram renaissance. There's also Enneagrammer.com where they've really created a whole database of officially typed people and they've found a lot of really interesting things. Like they found a lot of mistypes in their opinion. Um, yeah, I saw like a news flash maybe two years ago or something that was talking yeah. about how like Enneagram is no longer legitimate or something like that. Well, you ago. know, from scientific perspectives, I think they're going to have a hard time ever proving it because it's kind of like, that person's Mars crazy. No, they're Venus crazy. Like It's right. basically like w which which planet is intoxicating them with its planetary rays, you know? I mean, this is not exactly yeah. the scientific uh, conversation, but... Um, but yeah, there have been, we're in a real Renaissance time. The traditional instincts put the sexual, social, and self-preservation instincts as the sort of three fundamentals, and you have them in an order. So for instance, people have told me I'm a social type, but I actually believe I'm the sexual social, so that I have sexual first, and I have the least amount of self-preservation. Sexual first means I'm always looking for the intensity of connection and the passion of the one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm sort of... Um, like if you look at Enneagram 1, the sexual subtype is um, a little bit, it's kind of the counter type for the one because the one is so puritanical and has a lot of righteous anger. I just opened up to that page and <laughs> yeah. so on. And it's like in a lot of wait, forbidden pleasure. What's going on here? Um, <laughs> but see, the sexual subtype is jealous, is fundamentally jealous. And it's jealous of the other people who are... It's basically, it actually gets back to the Jonah of Nineveh myth, the, the original biblical Jonah. Like he was ultimately jealous. He was ultimately a hater because all these people are having sex out of wedlock and doing all these things. Mm -hmm. And he was like, God's going to kill you. And then, because God said, tell them all I'm going to kill them, you know? And then yeah. he told them and then God didn't kill them. And they're like, Jonah's a charlatan. He's a false prophet. Look, God didn't kill us. And then Jonah's like, why didn't you kill them, God? And God's like, eh, I had mercy, you know, <laughs> eh, just mercy. Just, gave, just had some mercy, you know. And then, and then Jonah was like so jealous of these people who had basically shirked right. God and then shown mercy that mercy. his puritanical righteous anger. I mean, Jonah was, was surely a, a one. Um, and uh, we won't get into the past life question at this point. But anyway, um, so where were you around 700 yeah, BC, exactly, Jonah? Yeah. Were you around the Nineveh the area? Do I reckon? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but but you know the version of that myth I like the best is actually that the whale was the savior. That that Jonah was recognized that the uh, storms were caused by him and his flight from God, so he decided to commit suicide. So Jonah's really a story of suicide, and then right. God showing mercy on Jonah by sending the whale, sending the whale to save his life at the moment of suicide, kind of like jumping off the bridge and then surviving or something like that. You know. Mm -hmm. So I, I do really like that version of the story. But you can see that being the sexual subtype of the one, and again, people disagree with me all the time about this. People tell me I'm a nine, they tell me I'm a six, they tell me I'm a seven, they tell me I'm a five. Uh, they, I've been told I'm a two. I've been told I'm a three. I've been told I'm a four. I'm pretty much every oh, type. Actually, yeah. I'm just about every type I've been told. Maybe not an eight. eight That's nine, probably eight. the one I have not been told. But I've been told I, I, I've been told I'm a nine and a six quite a bit and also a five and sometimes a Three. So maybe so, you're a two then, because they're the ones that like have different. No, right, well, you, usually, maybe you usually ones. that's actually the nine, honestly. But it's mm -hmm. not. I, I would put it the other way. I would say that amateur enneagram scholars are deceived when they meet somebody who they're deceived by their own assumptions when they meet somebody who doesn't fit. 
the classical understanding. But if they go a little deeper, you can't really escape your Enneagram type. And if they've ever seen my anger, then I think mm -hmm. they would know that. I mean, I've only read like four sentences. Yeah. I don't actually seem like a two, but. No, so self-righteous anger is a big part of the one. Um, but again, the sexual oh. subtype, I've also been told I'm a social subtype and so on. Um, the sexual subtype is jealous, is fundamentally jealous. And that is probably the single biggest issue that I deal with. Um, I don't know if you got to attend Raphael Weisman's second healing event that he did at the conference, but he just nailed it. He, he called me up and I wasn't going to come, but it was kind of like, Jonah, I like to do one, use you as an example. And he said, so what issue are you dealing with? And I said, anger, because it was true. And about three months ago, uh, on the summer solstice, Jenny, my, my former partner, got married to a guy. And I have been so angry, I've been like at 11 like barely hiding my anger and mm. rage because not only did I encourage them to give it a shot and get together, but we had a whole promise and agreement that he would never interfere with my friendship with her, but he's across the rulership and got cold feet and then banned her from ever speaking to me again and all this stuff. Yeah. And I had all of this like rage and anger because I'm like, we were friends beyond anything else. Like we've, yeah. we were in a relationship and we were friends and we were in a relationship again and we we're friends again. Like, like, let me be her friend. And I was also mad at her because she was like letting her yeah, life be controlled in her, this way. It's yeah. ultimately, well, ultimately disappointed in her for choosing a really terrible guy like that. But, you know, but I also disappointed myself because I encouraged them to get together. I gave her all the undying support, basically said, you should see where it goes. And so I felt kind of a real mix of anger with different kinds of anger, shades of anger, yeah. many varieties of anger, <laughs> layers of anger, wrapped with anger, combined yeah. with a little bit of anger on top. It was some cold anger and some hot anger mixed in. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of it was jealousy because I'm like, well, they're married and, you know, they don't have to work. And, you know, he's a millionaire and owns these houses and they mm. just travel the world and all this stuff. And it's like, that's jealousy. That's resentment. That is the sexual subtype, which has this intense passion. Not something I'm proud of. You know, that's my cross to bear. It's been my fucking cross to bear since 700 BC. No, I mean, <laughs> joke. Uh, anyway, but you can see the social subtype is called non-adaptable. That's not me. I'm very adaptable. The self-preservation subtype is known as anxious or worried. I have a bit of worry because I also have six in my tri-type, which is a very worrisome um, yeah. type. But, you know, you can kind of see that the subtypes... So usually one of the three subtypes. But I don't yeah, know. and one will be the counter type, which is the most unusual, and sexual is the most unusual and rarest for any type one. So it's like Rafe Fines is spelled like Ralph Fines. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a sexual one. And you see, we have a similarity, right? A little bit of a similarity. Like, I'm not saying I'm the exact as him, but we have a certain passion and, like, sort of studious, gentlemanly thing. But also, you can tell that he gets really intense about things. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, you can imagine him getting <laughs> yeah. pretty pretty intense. And, totally. But anyway, but it's hard for people to recognize a one when they're a sexual subtype because it's so countertype to the one, mm -hmm. which is so puritanical. It's like the sexual mercury. We don't imagine mercury as being, like... Some of that us sexual. Do. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> so then, in your case, if you're a yeah. two, you would be either, um, you might be a social two, which would make you look a lot more like a nine or a three, or you could be a sexual two. You're definitely not the self pres two. I can see, I yeah. know self pres people like uh, Von Paul is self pres. Self pres is like, I can't do he's that. I have two? to go to bed early. No, he's an eight, but he's self, <laughs> but he's self pres. <laughs> No, he's so, but he's self pres okay. He actually grows to, to two. Each okay. of the eneotypes grow to another type, and so at his best, he acts like a two. But okay. no, but he's he's an eight. We can see um, eight is Bart Simpson. I was about to say that whole thing is just that's correct. No, no, no. Uh, eights flourish in an atmosphere of open competition. Uh, let's see what we have to see. Their habitual preoccupations include control of personal possessions and space, control of people who could influence them aggression and open expression of anger, concern with justice and protection of others, fighting and sex as a way of making contact, trusting people who can hold their own in a fight. Fighting as a way of making contact. Yeah, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody yeah. and then trusting them. Like, uh -huh, uh -huh. like he once like got really in James Alexander's face and then James was like, God. And then like, Vaughn was like, yeah, okay. I appreciate that. Like kind of like, you know, he, like, he was like kind of like, he's a real dude. Like it's cool. Or like, yeah. like my mom told him that at once and he's like, your mom, she's a strong woman. <laughs> I don't know if she said that exactly. She said something like that. She said, just yeah. shut up or something, you know? Oh and he said, God. he's like, your mom's a strong woman. Like he had respect for her after that. Okay. Noted. Yeah. But anyway, but you can see, um, so he's a self prez. So he's looking for satisfactory survival. Mm -hmm. If he were social, he'd be looking for friendship. Yeah. And if he were sexual, he'd be more possessive. 
Um, but you can just see like okay, these are the so aggressive, seductive, ambitious. I don't really feel ambitious either. I might be aggressive. You, then you're probably the sexual subtype. The sexual subtype. Here's the question: If you're at a party, do you look for the most interesting person in the room and try to escape the party with them? Because I do, and that's the sexual type. So I'm like. <laughs> I have this big conference, 158 people come. It's all so I can find the most interesting person. <laughs> Not that I even want to date them or anything.